swear words. We call them profanity, curse words, or expletives. If you're using them, then you're swearing, cursing, or cussing. If someone's judging you, then they'll call you a potty mouth, sailor's mouth, or gutter mouth. The word profanity comes from the Latin word profanus, which translates to outside the temple, signifying words that God don't like you. Historically, curse words and swear words were very different things. Cursing meant to call on some supernatural power to help you inflict harm, like damning someone to hell. While swearing referred to the other meaning of the word swear, which is to make a sacred promise or oath. Today, swear words are more generally used to express strong emotions like anger, frustration, or surprise, and they don't necessarily have the same supernatural or harmful intent as curse words. Many profanities and slang terms are incidentally four-character monosyllables, a fact that led to the creation of the term four-letter word, another euphemism for swear words. Most swear words in English include the sounds P, T, or K. These sounds are called stop consonants because they interrupt the flow of air when speaking, giving the word a short, punchy feel. On the flip side, consonant sounds like L, R, W, and Y are less likely to be used in swear words because they're weak little beta cut pansies. Swear words can sometimes be insults, like the word fuck can be both an exclamation of surprise or a nickname for your ex. Swear words can also be slurs, terms used to disparage or disrespect someone, like the word bitch has a history of demeaning women by comparing them to dogs on heat and demeaning men by implying that they're weak little beta c- Swearing, in some form or another, occurs in every language, which makes swearing a universal phenomenon. Even in constructed languages like Esperanto, which are designed to be free from swearing, tend to acquire profanity over time, because despite what your nana might say, swearing is an integral part of human expression. It's this universal nature of swearing that makes some believe that swear words are the basis for language itself. That's right, the first ever swear words uttered were probably fuck or shit. Anyone who's met a person from a far off land will know that the first thing you do after asking them where are you from and how long have you been here is to ask them to teach you the swear words in their native tongue. The sharing of the swearing is a bonding ritual between two separate tribes. A moment of cultural connection as you signify to one another that despite any perceived differences you may have in language, beliefs or faith, You can and will establish a common ground through the imparting of valuable colloquial vernacular and the mutual giggling about poo and penises. Because when it comes to swearing, even cross-culturally, many of our swear words share similar themes. They're either deistic, relating to God, religion, or magical things like witches and ghosts, or they're visceral, relating to sexual references of parts and acts or bodily functions. We manage to have these similarities even across differing languages and cultures because most swear words relate to universal human experiences and taboos, like sex and farts and religion and poo and farts. In Dutch, you can call someone an idiot by saying Klut Viol, meaning scrotum viola. In Mandarin, this word means turtle's head, a euphemism for penis. And Arschgeige literally means ass violin, used to describe someone who is incredibly annoying or incompetent in German. Ah, remember the days of getting into a yo mama battle with some kid from school? Your mama's so fat. Your mama's so stupid. Well, it turns out that making fun of someone's mother or making sexual references about her is common in many languages too. But the level of offensiveness can vary. For instance, it's quite inoffensive to say bre ni nanya, mother's vagina in the Philippines, but you'd be cruising for a bruising if you made umak or your mother jokes in an Arabic speaking country. The earliest known your mama joke is written on a three and a half thousand year old tablet originating from Sapar in North Babylonia. The translation reads, of your mother is by the one who has intercourse with her. What, who is it? Damn, somebody get the aloe. Animals also make an appearance in our swear words and insults with similar connotations across languages. In many languages, if you're called a pig, you're either fat, dirty, or greedy. Donkeys, goats, and chickens imply that you're stupid. And dogs are used to insult your parents, like son of a dog or son of a bitch. 
In places where religious values are deeply entrenched in the language, swearing often involves terminology relating to God, the devil, and hell. Or in places like Quebec, swear words come from items you might find in a church, like the words chalice used to express anger or frustration, or baptism, meaning baptism, which is similar to saying darn in English. Swearing that uses diseases as curses or insults is also common in many languages and cultures, reflecting the fear and stigma associated with illness. Like in Dutch, you can tell someone to get cancer. In Russian, Polish, Arabic, and Dutch, you can wish typhus on someone. And cholera is like damn in French, Italian, and Polish. Stats, 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 stats. Researchers estimate that swear words make up about 0.5% of our daily words, or one swear word for every 200 words that we say. Teenagers swear the most, no shit. Men swear more than women and use more offensive words. And the most popular swear word is fuck. The most prolific swearers in the UK come from Wales. The sweariest state in the US is Columbus, Ohio. And after this video ends, if you want to continue enjoying the soothing sounds of an Australian accent shouting obscenities, then you better head to Bendigo in Victoria. Coprolalia. Copper, meaning dung or filth, and lalia, meaning speak, prattle, or talk, is a type of copper phenomenon characterized by involuntary swearing. It is most often associated with Tourette's syndrome, but it actually only occurs in about 10% of people with Tourette's. And I don't need to tell you, but we all know that many swear words have multiple ways of using them. The word shit, for instance, is very versatile. You can say today was shit if you're describing having a bad day. If you want to insult someone, you can call them a shithead or a shit If you hit your head on a cabinet, you might say shit as a reaction. If you're describing a story to friends about almost getting pulled over by the cops, you might say figuratively, I shit my pants. And if that piece of cake is really good, you can say that's the fucking shit. Steven Pinker, a prominent cognitive scientist and linguist, identifies five different functions of swearing in his research. There's diphemistic swearing, swearing about a negative situation or subject. There's abusive swearing, which are insults. There's idiomatic swearing for casual conversation. Emphatic swearing to emphasize statements with emotion. And there's cathartic swearing as reflective responses to pain or stress. And speaking of shit, etymologists believe that the word shit traces back to Old English words such as skeet, meaning dung, skeet, diarrhea, and skitan, to defecate. From the proto germanic skit and the root ski, meaning to cut or split. The notion is of separation from the body. The general sense of excrement dates to the 1580s, but shit's alternative meaning describing an obnoxious person can be found as early as 1508. You know what they say, everybody poops. Additionally, the connection between fear and involuntary defecation has generated expressions in English since the 14th century. The term up shit creek, slang for being in trouble, is used in 1868 in a South Carolina context, whatever that means. By 1903, shit could mean to disrespect. By 1922, we get the phrase not give a shit, meaning you don't care, followed by to lie or tease, the term scared shitless, the meaning of misfortune or trouble, and the term shithole. Then shitless, shit bricks, shit hits the fan, and shitload come after that. When it comes to the word shit-faced, there is some contention. The OED states that its meaning of drunk came about in the 1960s as student slang. But a few years ago when I was in Scotland, my tour guide gave me the same story that comedian Daniel Sloss gave on Conan. You know the term shit-faced? It comes from Scotland. So uh, basically, obviously, there was no sanitation back in the good old days. So if you needed, when you were doing your business during the day, you'd do your business in just a bucket. So all the pee and all the number twos would go into that sort of bit. There was a time of the night where they just agreed to throw it out the window. It was about 7 p.m. and everyone would throw it out there and it would run down at the same time just so it wasn't happening all day. Throw out the window, you shouted the words Gardy Lou, which is uh, it's the Scottish way of saying Gardy Low, which is French for watch out for the water, okay. which was a very polite way of saying here's a bucket of pee coming at your face. <laughs> but some people would get too drunk during the day uh, after they'd finished work and they'd walk outside and they'd forget what time it was because watches didn't exist and someone above them would shout something in French and they'd look up <laughs> and that's how you were so drunk that you were shit-faced. Yeah. Nice. It's a good story, right? But according to Paul Collins at Slate, the term shit-faced might actually originate from the Middle English 
chit-faced. Chit meaning child or kitten. Collins states, Chitface, in fact, already had a long history. Thomas Decker's 1622 play, The Virgin Martyr, includes this complaint. I stole but a dirty pudding last day out of an arm's basket. Give my dog when he was hungry. And the Pekin Shitface page hit me in the teeth with it. <laughs> Shit also happens to be one of YouTube's safe for advertising words. So apparently I can say it as much as I want. But let's see if this video gets demonetized, shall we? But in terms of censorship, it wasn't always this free for the word shit. Despite its long history in the English language and mentioned in the earliest Greek translations of the Bible, by the 1600s, shit was taboo and rarely appeared in print, not showing up in Shakespeare or the King James Version Bible. And even in the late 18th century, it's still disguised by dashes. In the 1920s, shit was still being censored. And in 1957, a Hemingway story in the Atlantic Monthly shocked subscribers with its blatant use of the word. Surprisingly, shit was kept out of the Webster's New World Dictionary as recently as 1970. But it seems that attempts at censoring shit only made us want to say it more. This kind of recent study showed that despite the overall decline in swearing since the 1990s, shit is one of only two swear words that have increased in usage over time. And speaking of censorship... For as long as we've had swear words, we've been trying to manage how people use them. Censorship is the suppression, prohibition, or restriction of speech, communication, information, or other content that is deemed objectionable, harmful, sensitive, or inconvenient by authorities or regulatory bodies. The goal of censorship is to limit or control access to information and ideas, often to protect societal norms, maintain public order, or prevent the spread of harmful or offensive material. Censorship is the reason why us YouTubers have to say stupid shit like unalive. Because wherever there is censorship, you can be darn sure that we'll come up with a creative way to get around it. From euphemisms and minced oaths to replacing letters with asterisks or dashes, the language of swearing has evolved around the rules intended to restrict their use. You know those sequences of symbols you sometimes see in replace of swear words? This is called a Grawlix. Grawlixes first started appearing in cartoons in the early 1900s as a way of having characters express anger without influencing those young, impressionable minds of children and women with those dirty, dirty swears. And in TV and movies, we see all sorts of tricky stuff like blurring, muting, dubbing, and bleeping. But we all know what a bleep means, don't we? Or this is hilarious 1980s gadget called TV Guardian. Have you ever been watching a movie with your family and a scene comes on that makes you feel uncomfortable where they're speaking foul words? You say, son of a blankety blank, and you're sitting there uh, with your kids, and, uh, you know, we don't use those words in our home. Son of a... And we don't want our kids to say those things. And uh, they're on every TV program, seems like, these days. And so uh, we found a device that... We really love, it's called the TV Guardian, and what it does is it uh, filters bad words from TV shows. Um, it also filters them from movies, DVDs, anything you're watching on TV, really. It's blessed our lives so much that we wanted to pass this opportunity on to you. It's easy to hook up. Uh, basically what you do is you plug the power cord into the wall, you plug your DVD or VCR into the back here, and then you send this cord over to your TV. Here's an example of the movie Jurassic Park, which is rated PG-13, and in this particular scene, the actor says, what the heck? And you'll see that the TV Guardian replaces, it actually removes uh, the foul word, and uh, let me just show you real quick here. Rick Bray here with us with more on the TV Guardian. Now, what actually compelled you to invent the TV Guardian? Uh, I'm a dad. Uh, when my two kids were younger, we were on a family vacation watching E.T., and I was surprised by the language in E.T. <laughs> I just needed to do something about it. So. Oh, no, that's awesome. And like you said, you are on your, is it the sixth version now of this? This is the sixth version, yes. Uh, we made a lot of progress along the years. Uh, uh, we actually had it built into DVD players at one time, uh, but if you've ever bought it, if you bought a DVD player recently, the price is 
pretty much fallen through the floor. So they've they've tried to cut out all extra features, only have the essentials in it, and and our, our uh, technology is no longer in DVD players. But this will work with DVDs, so uh, you can buy it, connect it between your DVD player and television, and it will filter out the language. For cable, satellite, uh, whether you rent uh, a pay-per-view, video on demand, or you're just watching a TV show, you know, there's so many good programs that are on television. While you're at it, you might order several, because you're going to need one for each TV in your home, and it makes a great gift item. If you have any questions, feel free to give us a call or place your order right now. Son of a... But hang on, hang on, hang on. First, we could start at the beginning. We actually don't know what the first swear words were because while humans have been around for about six million years, we only started writing stuff down about five to five and a half thousand years ago. But we can imagine that communication evolved out of a reason to do it. The first verbal sounds were likely emotional, a guttural Gah! noise that came from a place of anger, urgency, or pain. But hey, let's fast forward a few thousand years. The first two recorded instances of what may be regarded as swearing come from ancient Egypt. A stone slab dating back to the era of Ramses III instructs the tribe to offer loaves in favor of his dead father in exchange for protection from the god Amun Re. The slab also describes a punishment to those who don't follow the instructions. They shall fall on the sword of Amun Re, unalived for sure. And in addition, a donkey shall copulate with him, he shall copulate with a donkey, and his wife shall copulate with his children. Ugh. Apparently, sexual threats involving donkeys were common in legal documents of this era. And some 3,000 years later, this saying, or something like it, is still used in today's Kurdish. And now over to ancient Greece, where the democratic environment of Athens allowed for open criticism and satire of political leaders and societal norms. Here, the oldest surviving sources of profane or obscene language comes from poems, plays, and pottery. Aristophanes, possibly the most famous comedic playwright of the time, used a lot of profanity and crude humour in his work. In his comedy The Clouds, a student of Socrates insults somebody by saying this, literally meaning, go to the crows. The ancient Greeks believed that after a person died, if their body was not given the proper funerary rites, then the person's soul would never be able to enter the underworld and they would be forced to wander aimlessly for all eternity. For a person's corpse to be left out for scavengers was considered the most horrible disgrace imaginable. Therefore, it was considered extremely insulting to tell someone, go to the crows. Aristophanes also gave us, literally meaning us, but... It was a reference to an insulting stereotype hurled at the Spartans by people in other city-states. And my favourite, only because of its creativity, which means to shove a radish up someone's asshole. And of course, the ancient Greeks had all the regular swear words that we would expect. Words mostly relating to body parts, functions and activities. And they also flipped the bird. But the vibes were different in ancient Rome. The Roman society had a strong military presence where the state expected 100% allegiance or you'd face severe punishment. There were clear social and legal distinctions between citizens and non-citizens. And your social standing and reputation within this hierarchy was very important. Men were expected to be dominant in sexual relationships while women were expected to be pure and modest. When a Roman swore at you, they swore to assert dominance, express disdain, or challenge your social standing. And they weren't coy about it either. Translations of Roman swearing in poetry are highly aggressive and violent. Funnily enough, in ancient Rome, it didn't matter who you got with or how low status they were, as long as you were the active sexual partner and not a passive one. Being accused of anything deemed sexually passive, like going down on a lady, was highly offensive to a Roman man. So you can blame the Romans for your Tinder date's poor performance. One of the harshest insults that you could receive would be an accusation that you're a Sinaitis, a derogatory term for an effeminate man or someone perceived to be passive in homosexual relationships. Ah, the sweet toxicity of Roman masculinity. No wonder men think about them all the time. And I know what you're thinking, these insults sound stupid. 
But in ancient Rome, accusations of sexual immorality could lead to legal action. The concept of infamia, loss of legal or social standing, was significant, and being labelled with certain insults could affect someone's status. In the Middle Ages, things shifted dramatically. The feudal system meant a rigid social hierarchy of kings, nobles, knights, and peasants, in that order. This is reflected in insults that demean someone's social rank or lineage. The church also had a much more significant role in regulating moral behavior during this time. So blasphemous statements like, by God's bones, were the worst things that you could say. Punishable by public shamings, fines, mutilation, and even death. Swearing still involved terms related to sex and bodily functions, but these were often considered less offensive than blasphemy. Terms like shitten and quent were common. For less severe infractions, including minor public swearing or insults, offenders might be placed in stocks or pillories as punishment, but at least it gave the local children something to do. You know what they say about the devil's hands. Funnily enough, many of today's swear words were not considered obscene during the Middle Ages. That's why we get all sorts of hilarious street names like Grove Cut Lane, Shitwell Way, and Fucking Grove. And people named Goodwin Clawcut, Thomas Turd, and Roger Fuck by the Navel. Coming to the end of the Middle Ages, religious oaths started losing their moral and legal power during the Protestant Reformation of the 1500s. The Renaissance saw a revival of interest in Latin and Greek texts, with all their glorious, dirty, dirty words. The invention of the Gutenberg printing press in the mid-15th century revolutionised the spread of literature, including works that contain swearing and vulgar language by writers like Geoffrey Chaucer and Shakespeare which of course led to a power struggle by religious and secular authorities attempting to control morally and politically subversive content. Because wherever there is push, there is also pull. In response, writers made even more covert and subtle forms of swearing and insults. And over time, blasphemy went from the most offensive things you could say to just kind of frowned upon in some settings. But twist ending, the words that were fine in the Middle Ages started becoming the new swear words. Fast forward to the Victorian era, a time known for strict moral codes, respectability and propriety. Almost everything was offensive in the Victorian era. Blasphemy was again a no-go, words of sexual or visceral nature were gone from print and conversation, and everything else was euphemized. Damn became darn, dang or dash. The devil became dickens or deuce. Bloody became bleeding or ruddy. Pregnant became in the family way or expecting. Trousers became inexpressibles, unmentionables, and etc. And legs, yep, legs became limbs or lower extremities. A woman in any class caught swearing would be shocking and unbecoming or unladylike. She would be judged harshly and risk her reputation and social standing. The upper classes were only to use refined language in public settings and avoid vulgarity by using euphemisms and coded words. Swearing was therefore only for the lower working class men, but they would still risk fines and imprisonment by authorities for saying things like bugger, bollocks and bastard. And that brings us all the way up to approximately 1901, or the beginning of the 20th century. The social class system that grew out of the Industrial Revolution and Victorian era had really solidified swearing as a sign of low class and poor upbringing. So in the early 20th century, if you were a public figure, a professional so-and-so, or someone in the public eye, the rules of social class and public decency kept you from swearing, in public at least. For everyone else, obscenity laws still maintained a strict boundary on what was considered acceptable speech. Many countries, including the US, the UK, and Australia had stringent obscenity laws that penalized the use of profane language in public. But in the 1920s, these conservative norms started to clash with the more liberal social attitudes of the day. In America, the prohibition of alcohol saw the rise of speakeasies, secret underground bars where people could get loose, dip the bill, and listen to the devil's music. And just as we see today, black Americans are credited for the language of the 1920s youth, also known as jive talk. Here we get all sorts of unique swear words and slang terms that reflect black American experiences and cultural values. Nerds was like saying, oh crap. Futs is a euphemism for fuck. 
Jeepers Creepers was Jesus Christ. Calling somebody all wet was like saying they were full of crap. If you've got your glasses on, then you think you're better than everyone. Sadder than a map means terrible. And icky is a stupid person or one who's not hip. Not to be confused with the icks. When you've seen a boy and you get the ick, like, it doesn't go. And it's one of those things, once you've, got, you've caught it, it's like, you know, it, like, takes over your body and it's like, it's just ick. Then, of course, the world went to war twice. And soldiers said whatever the fuck they wanted. After the World Wars, terms like bloody, which used to be considered highly offensive, became more commonly used by everyday people. But still, when it came to artistic expression, many books like Ulysses by James Joyce and Lady Chatterley's Lover by D.H. Lawrence were being banned for their explicit content and use of swear words. Hollywood was facing their own problems after the Supreme Court ruled in 1915 that films were commercial products and not subject to free speech protections. Censor boards started popping up in every state, forcing studios to put out multiple versions of movies under different state laws. Then towards the end of the 1920s, Hollywood was copying a lot of flack from the public and religious organizations who were lobbying for greater censorship of the film industry after a series of high-profile scandals. And the studios were faced with an important decision. Either they could leave it up to the government to control the film industry, or they could self-regulate. They chose the latter. And in 1930, the Hayes Code was drafted. By whom, you might ask? Father Daniel A. Lord, a Catholic priest. Father Thomas T. Little, a Jesuit priest. As well as Will H. Hayes, the president of the Motion Picture Producers and Distributors of America. AKA, the guy they brought in to do damage control when Hollywood's reputation for being an amoral skunk pit got the attention of legislators. The Hayes Code provided a set of moral guidelines for film content between 1934 and 1968 in the US. Under these new rules, no film could depict drugs, bodily functions, or childbirth, what the code referred to as repellent subjects, or any sexual act considered perverted, including homosexuality, romance, and just sex in general. Definitely no mixed race couples, and the clergy, once again, was sacred meaning that blasphemous words and phrases were outright banned, like Jesus, Christ, hell, and damn. And regarding swearing, obscenity in any word, gesture, reference, song, joke, or just by suggestion, was forbidden. Movie scripts had to be pre-approved, and it was the Production Code Administration, the PCA, headed by Joseph Breen, that had the authority to deny approval for any film that didn't comply with the code, effectively preventing it from getting into theatres. Around the same time, the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, was established to regulate basically all other forms of media in the US. And like the Hayes Code, the FCC also seeks to protect public morality and mainstream standards of decency. But the FCC doesn't actively watch TV shows and movies. Their investigations are driven by public complaints, relying on people to report content they find indecent. More on that later. The Hayes Code had a major impact on Hollywood films. While while it aimed to uplift moral standards, it also stifled creative expression and limited the exploration of complex social issues. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. Now we're in the post-World War II era. Despite conservatives clinging to traditional values, the wheels of change were already in motion. The big generation, including figures like Allen Ginsberg, Jack Kerouac, and William S. Burroughs, were particularly known for their explicit language and themes that shocked the mainstream. In the 1960s and 70s, the counterculture movement, sexual revolution, and civil rights movement led to more open and rebellious use of language. Swearing became a form of protest and a way to challenge social norms. Pirate radio stations emerged in the UK, broadcasting from ships offshore to avoid legal restrictions. These stations were known for flouting regulations, playing banned music, and you guessed it, swearing. The feminist movement also addressed taboo language, calling out gendered slurs and advocating for the right for women to swear. Because historically, and even now, women are judged harsher than men for swearing. Feminists like Jermaine Greer were instrumental in challenging aging notions about women and swearing. Then the rise of independent filmmakers, foreign films, and a general push for greater artistic freedom led to the Hayes Code's decline. In 1968, it was replaced by the MPAA Film Rating System, which classifies films based on age appropriateness rather than strict moral guidelines. And this allowed for greater 
flexibility in the use of swear words in films. But for radio and television, things were about to get spicy. And not in a good way. Just 13 years after Jack Parr, host of The Tonight Show, walked off the show in protest after NBC censored a joke that included the term water closet, which ironically is a pious Victorian era euphemism for bathroom, New York radio station WBAI aired George Carlin's seven words you can never say on television monologue. The trouble is, I was trying to find out what these words might be, and I wanted to know the ones that you could never say on television. I mean the filthy words that are always filthy. We have so many ways of describing these dirty words. Well, we have more ways to describe dirty words than we actually have dirty words. It seems to indicate that somebody was awfully interested in these words. They kept referring to them. They called them bad words, dirty, filthy, foul, vile, vulgar. Rude, crude, lewd, lascivious, indecent, profane, obscene, blue, off-color, <laughs> risque, suggestive, <laughs> cursing, cussing, swearing, and all I could think of was shit, piss, fuck, cunt, cocksucker, motherfucker, and tits. <laughs> Carlin was asking which of the 400,000 words in the English language were the ones that you couldn't say on air, regardless of context. And it wasn't long before John Douglas, a member of the conservative non-profit censorship group Morality in Media, tipped off the FCC, claiming that him and his young son, later revealed to be 15 years old, had heard the program on their car radio at around 2 p.m. Just over a year later, the FCC issued a declaration order where they deemed the language of the broadcast indecent. No formal penalty was imposed on WBAI, and they even said it might be lawful for them to broadcast Carlin's routine late at night when no children would be listening, as long as they warned the audience first. But despite the FCC's leniency, if more complaints were to come in about the broadcast, WBAI could risk further penalties, even loss of license. So Pacifica Foundation, the owners of WBAI, decided to challenge the order. And hey, they won. Chief Judge Bazelon argued that radio listeners could just change the station and that the FCC had pushed its authority over children too far at the expense of receptive adults. And the whole story could have just ended there. But the FCC just couldn't help themselves, and they decided to appeal to the US Supreme Court. And it really worked out for them. The Supreme Court ruled in favour of the FCC holding that the commission acted under its public interest powers for the concern of protecting children, may restrict indecent speech broadcasts during certain times of the day without violating the First Amendment speech rights of broadcasters. And this is huge, really, because the ruling provided a clear legal foundation for the FCC's authority to regulate indecent content, including swearing, according to their interpretation of indecency on all public broadcasts, meaning that from this point forward, the FCC can issue federal fines for indecent content aired on TV or radio between 6 a.m. and 10 p.m. But it doesn't end there. After the court ruled in favor of the FCC, their indecency enforcement efforts really ramped up. Between 1986 and 2001, the commission reportedly issued 52 fines for indecency, with the total amount of fine dollary dues somewhere between $25,500 to $49,000. But by 2004, that number was up to almost $8 million. At the same time, Congress considered bills to increase the FCC's power so that they could fine people way more money. And ultimately, President George Bush signed the Broadcast Decency Enforcement Act Act, which increased the potential penalties for indecency by roughly 10 times. Before all this, the maximum fine was $32,500 per incident. But after, the commission could impose a fine of up to $325,000 for each violation or each day for a continuing violation. And I'm sure the US Treasury was very happy. But it's all about protecting the children, right? Furthermore, the FCC reported that nearly all indecency complaints in 2003, about 99.8%, 
were filed by the Parents Television Council, the PTC, a conservative Christian advocacy group. The PTC were also responsible for about 99.9% of indecency complaints following the Janet Jackson wardrobe malfunction during the Super Bowl halftime show on CBS. Or as journalist Eugene Kane called it, the brief side of Jackson's right breast adorned by a nipple shield. But here's the issue. The problem of relying on PTC-generated complaints isn't because the complainants might be bullshitting for their own agenda, but rather, if the FCC is changing its policies because of particular interest groups, who certainly do have their own agendas, then the FCC are creating a potential regulatory skew that isn't reflective of how broader society really feels about Janet Jackson's nipple shield. Following the two most high-profile decisions by the FCC regarding Janet Jackson and also Bono's fuck moment at the Golden Globes, the FCC added a new definition to their regulations. Profanity. But this only made regulations harder for broadcasters to adhere to, and the US Supreme Court has agreed on multiple occasions that their definitions are too vague to be constitutional. See, the problem with telling people what they can't say is that you have to spell out what words are forbidden. And the FCC doesn't want to do that. You know what I mean? It's just like we've decided there'd be some words we won't say all the time. And I was just trying to find out which words they were. For sure. All of them. I wanted a list. Under the void for vagueness doctrine, a law is unconstitutionally vague if a reasonable person cannot tell what speech is prohibited and what speech is permitted. With all this drama with the FCC, the increased fines, the vague policy wording and inconsistent enforcement actions, it had this weird chilling effect on broadcast media where programmers just didn't know what to do. In 2005, 66 ABC affiliates decided not to air Saving Private Ryan for Veterans Day because they weren't sure if it would be deemed indecent, even though the FCC in 2002 had already ruled that it was not. So where are we now? Well, for comparison, at the height of this moral panic, the FCC complainants' data looked like this. There were these massive surges of complaints around particular events on broadcast media in 2004 and 2006, but indecency complaints for radio and television over the last eight and a half years are way down. So what happened? Well, the Bush administration ended in 2009, and Obama didn't really seem to care about this issue very much. In 2013, it seemed like the FCC was questioning their own policy on indecency complaints as they found themselves burdened with a backlog of almost 1 million complaints. There's been a steady decline in broadcast audience numbers since the introduction of cable, streaming platforms, and social media, which aren't under the FCC's jurisdiction. And the Supreme Court has continued to deny a number of FCC claims stating that the rules were divorced from reality. So I think they just gave up on the fight and started focusing on more important things like scammers who are looking for help in monitoring the music their youngsters listen to hello and welcome to don't be dirty she parental advisory explicit lyrics they're gonna say shit on television i'm gonna execute every motherfucking last one of you The last 34 years has been a whirlwind for swearing. Politicians, celebrities, your mum, everybody does it. And not just in private. Research shows that offence to words like fuck has been steadily declining. Even Americans are saying now. Swearing trends have changed the most for the working class, who in 1994 were by far the most prolific swearers, but just 20 years later are now about tied with the middle class, which is still only half of the swearing that students manage to do. Stats like this and new research by cognitive scientists challenge the poverty of vocabulary hypothesis, which is the idea that swearing is a sign of a weak vocabulary, a result of a lack of education, laziness, or impulsiveness. And these are pervasive traits that we associate with people who swear. We tend to judge people pretty harshly, rating them as lower on socio-intellectual status, less effective at their jobs, and less friendly. But new research shows a very different story. This research found that swearing may actually be a sign of intelligence. This research found that swearing was associated with honesty. A significant body of research has established that swearing can increase pain tolerance and may increase power and strength in physical activity tasks. Also, you can still swear even after damage to the left side of your brain. The left side of the brain has our languaging processing regions, but swearing appears to be centered on the right
right side, in the deeper ancient parts of our brains that are not associated with language at all, but rather emotions and memory. And even chimps do it. Yeah, chimps who were taught the sign language for poo so they could tell their handlers when they needed to use the toilet started using it like we do the word shit. But how do we feel about individual swear words now? One very small study in the UK rated swear words from least to most offensive. And this list reflects some current social values in the UK at least. So living in a secular society means we don't care so much about religious swear words. Words like shit and bitch are not that offensive, but still require grammatical censoring for this article anyway, then words describing certain body parts or words that are now considered slurs garner a stronger response, and the most offensive terms are the ones that have pretty consistently been at the top for the last few centuries. This is obviously not an exhaustive list, and as we've already learned, swear words and their levels of offensiveness are highly dependent on a number of social, cultural and political factors. But it's safe to say that the increasingly liberal attitudes towards swearing have been encouraged by a number of important court cases and policy changes from censorship bodies, the invention and widespread use of the internet, mainstream media, including reality TV shows like Jerry Springer, the cesspit of depraved teenage boy language that is gaming culture, cable TV like HBO and Showtime, and the subsequent streaming platforms that followed in their footsteps, who collectively are not governed by the same regulations as broadcast channels and do not have advertisers signing their paychecks. And of course, there's social media. A recent poll shows that 24% of Americans think the show has pushed the envelope too far, while a whopping 76% say they don't really give a shit. It seems like it was only yesterday that Janet Jackson's nipple shield completely shattered our innocent hearts and minds. But really, she looks pretty modest in comparison to the fashion choices of people today. I still find it wild the sort of TV shows and movies that are basically all about sex and objectifying hot people's bodies, but then swear words are the thing that is taking it too far. How are we still censoring words when we're looking at this? In most countries, media classifications rate content based on age appropriateness. They're basically trying to gauge the potential impact of the content on young minds. And despite critics who argue that these systems don't necessarily make evidence-based decisions with respect to what we know about child development, the age-appropriate system seems to be the best we can do for now. In the US, the MPA gives the power to a small group of parents to rate individual films and media. But when they ask a larger group of parents out in the real world, there's not an overwhelming amount of consensus. In a recent study of parent opinions by the MPA, most parents find that R would be an appropriate rating for the F word, but then 40% would rate a movie containing the F word as PG-13. The study also finds that profane language other than the N word are much less of a concern to parents than other things like nudity and hard drugs. And most swear words, except for the F word and the N word, are considered appropriate for PG-13 movies. They did leave out the big one though. That's right. It's time to talk about the biggest, baddest swear word of them all. The guaranteed to get you demonetized if uttered on YouTube. The legendary cunt. According to Etymology Online, the word cunt may come from the Middle English or Old Norse words meaning female genitalia. But others suggest a link with the Latin word for wedge from the root words for hollow place and women. Back when women were just a hole for you to stick your... Other links can be made to the Latin word cunus from the pie root skur to cut or skew to conceal or hide. Devan traces the word back to the root cut, meaning bag, scrotum, and metaphorically also a woman's hoo-ha. It might also potentially come from the Greek kythos, meaning vagina, buttocks, pouch, or small bag, Lithuanian kutis for money bag, and the old high German hodo, meaning testicles. The first reference in English is the street name Grope C Lane in the 13th century, presumed to be where sex workers worked. Around the same time, it's mentioned in a proverb from a manuscript that reads, give your cunt wisely and make your demands after the wedding. Ah, oh, yeah, I remember getting that advice. The big old C word is used in medical writing in the 1400s, but avoided in public speech since the 15th century and considered obscene since the 17th. In Middle English, there's also conte, 
sometimes written like this, which can be found from the late 14th century in the works of Chaucer. I remember those banned books from the 20s. Both contained the C word. Lawrence used it a scandalous 10 times in Lady Chatterley's Lover. There's two primary meanings for the C word. First being a word for female genitalia, and second as a term to insult or disparage someone, with a history of being used to degrade women and femininity. Up until recently, the C word was the worst swear word that you could say in the US. But in other places like the UK, New Zealand and Australia, it can also just be a reference to a mate. Like Baza is a funny c***. It's almost like a term of endearment. Or it can be used to describe something that's really bad, like she had a c***t of a job. Australian feminists like Jermaine Greer, as well as drag performers and the LGBTQ plus movements have had a pivotal role in the linguistic reclamation of the C word. Linguistic reclamation is when words intended as weapons against a particular group are appropriated by their targets as a way of blunting those weapons and redirecting their force. Think about how the meaning of the word queer has changed significantly over time. Now, even in the US, the C word has found some acceptance, which also means it's lost some of its power. Australians are particularly known across the globe for our high tolerance and how love of swearing. Good morning, sir. How are you? Are you from the media? Tell the Prime Minister to go and get from Nelligan. We really enjoy doing this head. Thank you very much. Which can be traced back to the first colonists slash invaders. Convicts from poor working class backgrounds who were sent here for stealing a loaf of bread and other crimes, I guess. Swearing is very much interwoven into the Australian sense of egalitarianism as a way to challenge authority, embody a certain cultural identity and subvert the political or social order. On a casual level, we're one of the most open-minded when it comes to swearing, including the C word. But even with all that, it doesn't necessarily mean that you can get away with swearing in public. Each year, thousands of Australians incur fines or criminal convictions for swearing, the use of offensive, indecent or obscene language in public is punishable in all Australian states and territories. Fines for public swearing can be anywhere between $287.50 in Queensland up to $6,000 in Western Australia. Offensive language crimes are commonly used by police in response to those who swear at or near them in a public space. And it's worse if you're brown. In a 2009 study, basically all the charges issued for offensive language to Aboriginal people was because they swore at or in the company of police. And while Aboriginals make up only 3% of the population in New South Wales, they account for 17% of all adults and 22% of all juveniles proceeded against for offensive language. The overwhelming majority of charges for offensive language are in response to the C word and the F word. In 2015, a 75 year old Sydney activist named Danny Lim was arrested for offensive behaviour and fined $500 for wearing this sign about the then Prime Minister Tony Abbott. I couldn't find an unblurred photo, but the blurred word is actually can't with an A, but the A is turned upside down. Lim appealed against the fine, and in 2017, it was overturned by the New South Wales District Court Judge Andrew Scotting, who said, while the conduct was inappropriate and in poor taste, I am not satisfied beyond reasonable doubt it was offensive. The front of the sandwich board was capable of being construed as being clever or lighthearted, while also capable of being read as the word can't. The language used was clearly a play on words. Scotting went on to say, this is an essential and accepted part of any democracy, that criticism can often extend to personal denigration or perhaps even ridicule, but still maintain its essential character as political comment. There is no reason to conclude that the Prime Minister, as the leader of the federal government, should be treated any differently to any other person who holds or seeks political office. Then, two years later, Lim was arrested and fined again for wearing this sign, after a nearby police station received a single complaint from someone who said, as a woman, I found this word highly offensive. And look, whether you consider the word offensive or not is personal to 
you. But in this instance, the behavior from police just seemed completely over the top. I'm not going to play the video of his arrest, but I'll link it below if you want to watch it in full. Basically, the police approach Lim at Bangaroo Station in Sydney and they tell him he has to take the sign off. He takes the sign off and seems to be compliant with police. Then the police say that they have to confiscate his sign and they start to pull it from his hands. Mr. Lim becomes distressed, calling out to onlookers for help while the police struggle to put handcuffs on him before taking him away. Some members of the public step in to defend Mr. Lim, arguing that the sign was not offensive and calling the police behavior disgusting. But what really makes you question the whole situation is the footage recorded by the police body camera, which shows officers referring to the onlookers as fucking pathetic and social justice idiots and accusing Mr. Lim of being full of shit. So the police can go around using profane language while still in public and on shift in a professional setting while they're simultaneously arresting a man for a similar crime. Cool and normal. But Danny Lim took it to court again, and Magistrate Jacqueline Milledge was very critical of his arrest, calling it heavy-handed and unwarranted, and criticized the language that the police used. But when it comes to the sign, Milledge said the sign is provocative and cheeky, but it's not offensive. And now I wish the story ended there, but unfortunately it only gets worse for Danny Lim. In November 2022, Mr. Lim, who was now 78 years old, wore another sign similar or identical to the one he was previously fined over but successfully contested in court. During the attempted arrest, Mr. Lim appears to be forced to the ground, falling headfirst. And this time, he sustained much more significant injuries and had to be taken to hospital where he was diagnosed with a subdural hematoma. He wasn't arrested in the end, and New South Wales police were said to be conducting an independent review into the officer's actions. But a year and a half on, and I can't find any recent news regarding their review. And this sort of shit doesn't just happen in Australia. The UK has various offences for threatening abusive words or behavior, or if you use obscene and profane language in public in the presence of a police officer. And in the US, although it is completely legal to swear at police, people still do get arrested for it. So what's next for swearing? Well, the core swear words that we all know and love aren't going anywhere. But what tends to happen is the more that we use a swear word, the less it has the ability to shock, offend, or hurt us. And over time, if we don't make an effort to censor these words, they will eventually lose their power. Like the word shit, which we've seen go through many different errors. Banned from the dictionary just 50 years ago, and now it's hardly more offensive than the word crap. But maybe we want to know what the swears of the future will be. Well, in order to predict that, we just need to look at what words have the most power now. Because swear words rely on their power to be what they are. They must be taboo. They must challenge the norm. Currently, the most offensive words in the English language are slurs. Our sensitivity to any kind of derogatory term or epithet is increasing. It's it's become unacceptable to define someone or something using a single word, including words that characterize a person based on their race, religion, sexuality, or mental or physical capabilities. But it extends even further to the way people look, their weight, or describing their perceived gender. Identifying people at all has become much more complicated, and we worry about offending one another with our words. So although I like that it's not acceptable to use slurs to identify certain characteristics anymore, and I see how these changes in how we talk to and about one another has done so much good, unfortunately it's derogatory terms and slurs that will likely evolve into the swear words of the future. Simply because we can't say them, because we give them power. And I think we can already kind of see this happening with how we choose to disparage one another today. Words like Karen or woke, snowflake, bigot, and incel. Perhaps it's no longer acceptable to call someone fat, but we definitely have plenty of words for discrediting and dehumanizing people on the opposing end of the political spectrum. A lot of the insulting words we use today stem from political affiliation, showing just how much politics is intertwined with our identities at this point in history anyway. 
I didn't think that I would come to this conclusion in the end, but I actually think I agree with protecting the power of the swear words that have stood the test of time. Yes, that might mean some censorship, but the visceral swear words that we have have many ways of using them. They do something for us emotionally, and they don't necessarily attack or hurt people in the same ways that slurs do. I'm certainly not vouching for any heavy regulatory censorship because as we've seen with the FCC, it just creates a demand for it that people will ultimately figure out how to circumnavigate. But I really hope that with a careful balance, we could keep the words like fuck and shit around just a little bit longer. And when it comes to slurs, it seems like the best option is linguistic reclamation. Take the words used against you and make them yours. Okay, and that's all I've got for you today. I hope you enjoyed this video. As always, if you want to continue the discussion in the comments with me. Today, my question is, where do you sit when it comes to swear words? Do you believe in full artistic expression or do you think we're heading for trouble? Let me know in the comments. And of course, a huge thank you to my 13 Patreons who have made this video possible. Bye.